Hey guys, it's Alex. In one of my previous videos, I mentioned that, in my opinion, you shouldn't necessarily be using Final Cut Pro as your video editor. And a lot of you came back asking why, which is totally valid. So I wanted to give you a little bit of my perspective from the sound side of things as to why I don't think I see that nonlinear editor used in as many workflows as you might expect. Now, in terms of nonlinear editors, there are a few out there that you see most commonly. Avid Media Composer is the big one that's kind of used at professional levels. Adobe Premiere, which is another really common one. You have Final Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve. The reason I don't recommend Final Cut Pro as much as the others really boils down to two reasons that are sort of tied in with each other. Final Cut Pro does not support the import and export of OMF or AAF files. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with OMFs or AAFs, they are basically the standards that the industry uses to pass around footage and audio, specifically audio, from one piece of software to another. Final Cut Pro, as of version 10, no longer supports the export of OMF or AAF file formats. They've replaced it with this IXML workflow that in order to get information properly into another audio editor, you have to do this kind of weird round trip through third-party software where to convert all that XML information into useful OMF or AAF format so that somebody in sound can read it. That's been cited as one of the reasons to move away from the software. I do think it's an important thing to pay attention to and I think it's kind of frustrating, but it points to a bigger problem that for me is way more important than just having or not having one specific feature. It's that a company removed a feature that is so integral to the workflow with no real explanation as to why it needed to happen, and in most people's opinions, it didn't need to happen, and they didn't replace it with anything better or more compatible. They, they made it more complicated. I'm not really interested in that. I don't really want to deal with that kind of risk because the timelines and the complexity of these sorts of projects don't really allow for that sort of thing. All of the other major picture editorial programs include this functionality, and even if it doesn't get it right all the time, looking at you, Adobe Premiere, it still at least is compatible enough to figure out what the quirks are and pass files back and forth within any piece of software natively. And again, the fact that a company as large as Apple chose to remove that functionality without really telling its user base why it was necessary or giving them a viable alternative that just works, it makes me question what they're going to do with that program in the long term. And I really want to be able to trust the company that I'm using the software of much longer than just the next version. Now, that being said, Final Cut Pro is still a really good piece of software. It's good at what it does. And if you're working in sort of a siloed environment where you don't necessarily have to collaborate with other people or you're just doing sort of the, the one person editorial crew thing, it's totally fine, it's gonna work for you, and all of the skills that I talk about on this channel are going to still apply directly to your workflow. However, as soon as you wanna start collaborating with more people or get into more complex projects, you'll start seeing Final Cut Pro go away and people prefer Adobe Premiere or Avid Media Composer. And just as a last thought, every single one of these pieces of software is gonna have its strengths and it's gonna have its weaknesses. It's really down to figuring out what works best within your workflow. So if Final Cut's the right solution for you, Great, use it. At the end of the day here, my big point in all this is not, oh, don't use Final Cut Pro or stay away from that piece of software or something like that. It comes down to work with what you've got. It's not really about the tools so much as it is about the creativity of the person using them. And I think that's the most important takeaway from all of this. If you're planning on collaborating with somebody who specializes in post sound sometime in the future, I'd highly recommend you look up something like Premiere or Media Composer if you haven't already. But again, you're gonna be able to work with what you've got and all the skills that I talk about are gonna be able to translate. Now, let me answer some more questions. Would you use noise reduction tools after EQ, compressing, and de-essing or before them? Uh, so this goes into order of operations. And again, my idea whenever I have any kind of processing is to make the processors that I'm using each do as little work as possible to maintain sound quality. So it makes sense for me to use any kind of denoising tools before I do anything else because if I'm EQing after I denoise, my EQ doesn't have to deal with any of the noise that was there in the first place. Whereas if I'm EQing before denoising, I've got all this crap that I don't really want in my sound that I'm still trying to work on. So by doing all of those noise reduction techniques before I do any other sort of dialogue processing like EQ, compression, de-essing, it's getting the cleanest signal that I can manage into those processors down the line and in theory will give me the best quality of sound afterwards. 
For podcasts, when should I match loudness in my workflow? I've read to do it after you're editing, normalizing, compression, etc., and I've read to do it before all of those things. This is one of those simple sounding questions that's actually very complex, and what you're asking about is effectively dialogue mixing. What I've found to be most effective in my workflows on pretty much anything, whether it's YouTube or it's feature films or it's television or it's ad campaigns, whatever, whatever the content may be, is you kind of do this continuously over the course of the whole audio process. I'll start by bringing up and lowering levels to get things a little bit more consistent on my source audio, and then I'll run my dialogue chain of EQ Compressed DS, and using the combination of the compressor and level adjustments after all of that processing, I'll kind of create a balance all the way through that will lend itself to, again, each component doing the least work possible, and also kind of bringing the consistency into the right place over the entire course of the workflow. So if you're wanting to keep your workflow simple, I might recommend doing any loudness matching at the end of the process, but if you do it kind of continuously through, I think you'll find better results, even if it is a little bit more complicated and challenging to manage. When you EQ dialogue for a film scene, do you do it using the effects that are in the scene as well, or do you isolate the dialogue and do it separately? Typically, you'll find that people will mix dialogue independently from music and effects to start. And in the film world, that's in a process called pre-dubbing, where you basically get the dialogue sounding as good as you can by itself, and then you bring in everything else around it and make tweaks from there. In Sound for Picture, dialogue is typically the most important storytelling tool that you've got. Music kind of brings itself in to inform you how to feel about whatever is being said or whatever's going on on screen. And then sound effects provide the immersion into that world that lets you kind of experience it as though you were there. So again, with that in mind, dialogue is usually treated separately before anything else, and then music's brought in, and those are balanced against each other. Then last, sound effects are brought in to kind of augment and fill in all of the gaps of that. So that about wraps it up. Hopefully this video gave you a little bit of a new perspective from the sound side of things on video editing. If you liked the video, don't forget to hit like, hit subscribe, come follow me over on Instagram at AXK, and thanks for watching.